from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. A strong statement from one celebrity chef. I'm done with vegans. I'm absolutely done, done, done with vegans. Why he says he's banning certain eaters from his restaurant. Fears grow in the Corn Belt. Over the next five to seven days, there really is not much prospect for significant relief in the Midwest. As crop conditions continue to sink. The EPA's big announcement when it comes to biofuel blending levels. So that's a significant number, and I think that's something to keep in mind. The key numbers and what they mean for producers right now on Ag Day. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. The EPA announcing the biofuel blending volumes for the next three years. And while there's an increase in the amount of biofuels oil refiners will have to blend, the volumes include just 15 billion gallons each year of corn-based ethanol. Ag Day's Michelle Rook joins us. And Michelle, the ethanol and biodiesel industries are not happy with these levels. That's right, the biomass-based diesel blending mandates were a real disappointment for the industry, coming in below the initial proposal and current production. As far as corn-based ethanol, EPA flatlined those levels for the next three years, representing a missed opportunity. EPA set the final corn-based ethanol mandate at the initial draft level for 2023, but below the proposal for 2024 and 25, and the levels were below what the ethanol industry asked for. There is 15, 250 million for 23. That 250 million there is the second half of a remand, a court-ordered remand that was owed to conventional uh, biofuel but then they lowered it in years 23 and 24 down to 15 billion gallons. However, he says those renewable volume obligations still exceed previous blending mandates. We haven't ever had 15 billion gallons blended within the domestic marketplace. So that's a significant number. And I think that's something to keep in mind. We certainly wanted to see the additional 250 million gallons simply because that does indicate to everyone looking at that as a growth pattern uh, for conventional biofuels. Braden Camp says that won't stifle ethanol growth, but it is a missed opportunity. Now for biomass-based diesel, EPA increased RFS volumes in the final rule by only 590 million gallons over the three-year period, when production is already up nearly 400 million gallons in the first five months of 2023 versus last year. When you consider the fact that the Department of Energy's own Energy Information Administration, kind of an independent data collection uh, agency, is projecting increased volumes of 650 million gallons this year, uh, more than 800 million gallons next year. EPA's proposal of, of raising our volumes by 60 million this year uh, and 200 and some million uh, next year is just a small percentage of what we see coming online. He says it remains to be seen how negative the RFS will be for the industry in terms of investment in feedstock capacity and the build out of additional biomass based diesel capacity. I'm Michelle Work reporting for Ag Day. All right, thanks, Michelle. While farmers keep an eye on Washington policy, they're also watching crops struggle in the Midwest due to a lack of rain. The latest crop progress report says just 55% of the corn crop is rated good to excellent. In Illinois, it's just 36% and 32% in Michigan. Meanwhile, soybeans aren't faring any better. 54% of that crop now rated good to excellent, with just 33% of the Illinois crop rated that high and 23% in Michigan. Now, USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey says the prospects for crop saving rains in the Corn Belt don't look promising over the next week due to what's being called an omega block. Over the next five to seven days, there really is not much prospect for significant relief in the Midwest. And in fact, if you look at the central part of the Corn Belt, almost zero chance of rain over the next week. You have to go to the far eastern and southeastern Corn Belt, the Ohio Valley, to get into some rainfall there. We should see some rain breaking into the Dakotas, Nebraska, and parts of the upper Midwest as we move later through the week. But that is going to leave a lot of the Midwest unfavorably dry. And with continuing diminishing soil moisture as we head toward the very key reproductive stage of development for corn and soybeans. Meanwhile, the hot, dry weather pushing winter wheat harvest forward in Missouri. Nationally, 15% of the crop is cut. It's normally about 20% complete. Oklahoma running 14 points behind normal, while nearly half of the Missouri crop is now in the bin. And it's not just drier conditions that are the issue, but 
high heat. Texas power grid operators urging people to reduce their electricity use. It's due to a heat wave that has baked the south and caused power outages in several states. Temperatures across Texas are running about 10 to 15 degrees above normal. Now in south Texas, heat indices were forecast to feel as hot as 120 degrees. And that may not be the end of this record-breaking heat wave. And the South meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht has more. Matt. Yeah, Clint, we're getting that uh, Rex block, that blocking pattern setting up once again across the United States. And uh, unfortunately, not only is it bringing extreme heat, uh, but also uh, extreme dryness as well. The latest root zone map showing what's going on regarding the uh, moisture uh, in the, uh, the ground, not necessarily the atmosphere. We'll look at that uh, coming up in a bit. I see a lot more red, the uh, very dry, if not extreme, but also extending. If there has been a kind of a major update compared to the last couple of days or last week, it's right into Indiana, Illinois, and up into Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, uh, where it has gone from uh, being normal to dry into the red, the very dry or even the extreme. Uh, now we mentioned those extreme temperatures uh, coming up a little bit. We'll take a look at the jet stream because a similar pattern could be setting up uh, this time next week. But before that, some much needed rain in and across the area. So there's a look at your root zone map coming up in just a little bit. We'll take a look at your extended forecast. But first, I want you to check uh, this out over here. Go ahead and look at uh, your screen. Just a beautiful picture that was sent in. And uh, this is coming in from Paul. We updated you on how the wheat harvest is going a few moments ago. Now, here's a look at Paul Penner's crop in Kansas. He says this field survived drought, wind, and hail. He is predicting a three to five bushel loss from the hail. Uh, great to see he's able to harvest, though. I'll have more on your forecast coming up. Florida tomato growers say Mexican producers are still dumping tomatoes on the U.S. market. It's the latest in a long dispute between both countries. The Florida growers asking the Commerce Department to terminate a 2019 agreement. That measure suspended anti-dumping duties on tomatoes imported from Mexico. Well, now the Florida Tomato Exchange says the agreement, which introduced new rules on pricing and inspections, isn't working. The exchange says domestic farmers have gone from an 80% share of the market to now 30%. And tomato importers, well, they say this latest move is just an effort to avoid innovation and a push to monopolize the U.S. tomato market, ultimately forcing prices higher on consumers. USDA says it's buying up $39 million worth of table grapes. They are to be used for feeding programs in schools across the country. They'll be distributed from the end of July through the middle of December. USDA says the total amount purchased is just under 2 million 19 pound cartons. They range in price range from 1537 to 2697 per carton. Russia says there are no grounds for extending the Black Sea grain deal. It says the United Nations broker deal is not being properly implemented. Meanwhile, the UN Secretary General is calling for an acceleration of Black Sea grain shipments from Ukrainian ports. But a UN spokesperson says food exports have dropped significantly from their peak last October of 4.2 million metric tons to just 1.3 million metric tons in May. The Secretary General is also urging both sides to do their utmost to ensure the continuation of the agreement, which is up for renewal the middle of next month. Illinois farmer and global philanthropist Howard G. Buffett continues his push for support in Ukraine. He stopped in London this week to discuss what he's seen during his eight visits there. Speaking at the Ukraine Recovery Conference, Buffett is asking for additional support, especially when it comes to demining the countryside. His foundation spent $150 million supporting Ukraine in 2022, providing food to rural communities and helping replace farm equipment destroyed in the war. He has plans to double that support this year. Those falling crop condition ratings pushed July soybeans above $15. We'll talk markets coming up next. And eating healthy foods is important no matter your age. We'll see how one nutritionist is teaching those lessons to seniors in Louisiana in the country. Ag Day is brought to you by Endzone from Farm Shop MFG, which allows you to rehydrate your soybeans from 10 to 13%. On a 20,000 bushel bin, that's an extra semi-load added to your bottom line. Order your end zone fan control now for as low as $2,900 while supplies last. Dry weather and a drop in condition ratings continue to fuel grains midweek with July soybeans topping $15. Michelle Rook is back with more on how long this weather rally could last in markets now. 
Big rally in the grains on Wednesday. Tom Fitzmaier, Summit Commodity Brokerage, joining us with analysis. And Tom, this rally seemed to be pushed by kind of a surprise in both crop ratings as well as this subsoil moisture condition. They, they weren't obviously anticipating as big a drop as we saw. And, and in addition to that, we've talked quite a bit about how dry things were in the eastern, east of the Mississippi. Uh, but a, a lot of the big drops in that report uh, that, that came out Tuesday afternoon uh, showed a drop in the western, central to western Corn Belt. So I think that caught people off guard a little bit, too, because they'd have kind of been assuming that that area was OK. Uh, the other thing that I thought was important was this was this uh, huge, large percentage of the crop, uh, or ground anyway, that's deficient in subsoil moisture. You know, a lot of times this t in, in June you can you can sustain the crop fairly well without a lot of rain if you have good subsoil. But this is a situation where uh, that subsoil is not there to sustain the crop, so you need to have rains, and we just haven't been getting them, and we don't have a lot of them in the forecast. So. Um, it, it's starting to get to the point where uh, people are starting to talk about, well, certainly that 182 bushel per acre yield on corn is, is sort of off the window. Uh, now is it 177? Is it 174? Just, you know, what kind of damage is going to be done to the crop here? So we did close above, like you say, some major resistance areas and moving averages. And so where do you think we project to now? Oh, I think there's another 30 cents up in corn. I, I don't think it'd be that difficult to see the December contract work its way up toward uh, 648, 650 range. Uh, the, 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 um, the November soybean contract up in the 1420 range, uh, I don't think would be that hard to, hard to come by another, you know, 40 cents or 60 cents up. Um, so there, there's some room for it to move on the upside. Soybeans also got some help from the big rally in the meal market with those meal oil spreads being unwound. And that was really tied to this EPA RFS announcement, wasn't it? That, that was a disappointment, uh, I, I, particularly to the, to the bean, bean oil industry. Uh, so you end up with bean oil down the limit. Uh, that sent the spreads crazy. So a lot of buying meal, selling oil as, as people try to uh, correct that spread. Uh, gave meal a really nice pop. Thanks for joining us, Tom Fitzemeyer with Summit Commodity Brokerage. That's Markets Now. Ag Day is brought to you by Lamar's Toy Store, the largest and most diversified farm toy store in the U.S. They have new and old and do restorations and customizations too. You need to see it to believe it. Visit lamarstoystore.com or call us at 712-546-4305. I'm meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht. So I want to look at uh, some of those temperatures coming up later on this afternoon. This is not the heat index. This is the wind chill. This is triple digit heat on the thermometer once again through Texas. And I know you say Texas, especially in the summer, and you think uh, heat or at least the triple digits. But we're about uh, three weeks, if not a month, ahead of schedule with some of the numbers that are showing up in San Antonio and Brownsville, Texas, 115 degrees. The other reason I show this is a similar pattern uh, set to take shape with the ridge developing next Wednesday and Thursday. In fact, we'll start right there with the temperature outlook June 26th through June 30th, a cooler back into the Midwest for a short amount of time. But when you start to see the uh, temperature outlook, increase back here to the west. It's a really big signal that that jet stream is going to be moving back to a pattern that would support a ridge uh, over a, a kind of trough digging through, which would bring rain and cooler temperatures. We'll look at the jet stream coming up in just a second. Just a second. Precipitation outlook June 26th to June 30th, same time period. Dry where that heat is going to be, and then a little bit more moisture back off to the north and east. Unfortunately, we are not getting it where we need it, which is back into Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, parts of the Midwest, including Ohio and over into Pennsylvania. But we are starting to see the chances for a wetter than normal pattern uh, coming up for the Northeast and back into the Dakotas. So let's go and take a look at that jet stream. It's an upper level cutoff low. We've been tracking the last couple of days. We'll continue to track it uh, back up to the Northeast. It's actually going to get that uh, kind of captured uh, by a trough moving through the jet stream Friday and Saturday. That could bring some rain portions of the area into the northeast. Uh, there's a, a weak clipper system that, again, could bring some rain to portions of Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, and Michigan. Uh, I looked at it earlier. Michigan certainly needs the rain. But what I want to point to is what comes after Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. You see this uh, trough move off to the east. That's where these lines go down, where the lines come up. 
that's the ridge. And a big circle like this uh, puts numbers like we just looked at back into the forecast next Tuesday and Wednesday. And then by Wednesday and Thursday, this will continue to build back across the United States, limiting significant rain chances and increasing the heat across the nation. And there's the jet stream for next Thursday. Let's start off in Dover. We do have some showers in the forecast high around 74 degrees, low of 68. Lake Wales, Florida. Got some evening thunderstorms, otherwise a dry day. High 93, low of 72. Jessup, Georgia, high of 84, low of 72. Interfering with the shipment of livestock may soon be a felony in Missouri. There's a bill awaiting a decision from the state's governor that would criminalize anyone who knowingly stops or otherwise interferes with a vehicle transporting livestock. That includes provoking or disturbing the animals or putting things on them that can affect their health. The punishment would include a misdemeanor and a $1,000 fine. The state representative behind the bill says her sponsorship was fueled by issues in transferring hogs within her district that includes a large pork processing plant. Now she says trucks were being slowed down or stopped, tainted water was thrown into the trailer, and hypodermic needles were Put into loaded hogs. She says acts like this on livestock are not only a problem when it comes to production, but the costs due to these acts may be passed on to consumers. A celebrity chef in Australia says he is, quote, absolutely done with vegans and has moved to ban them from his restaurant. Now, according to Nine News in Australia, chef John Mountain made the decision after a dispute with a customer. It was over a complaint the customer had made against the lack of vegan options on the menu at the restaurant fire. And they were charged $32 for vegetables. Please go find another kebab shop somewhere that's happy to give you that plastic rubbish that you enjoy to eat so much. Go and enjoy your life somewhere else. I've worked for some of the best chefs in the world and to be told that you're not good enough, by some sort of influencer type vegan person that I'm not into the 2023s, killed me. Now after the ban, Mountain says business is booming. Mountain has starred in cooking shows in Great Britain. Hey, a good nutritious diet should be a priority for all of us. Up next, we'll head to class with one Louisiana nutritionist sharing those lessons with experienced eaters in the country. Registration is open for the 2023 Pro Farmer Crop Tour. Join our team as we gain insight on the 2023 growing season, in person or online. Visit profarmercroptour.com forward slash register to select the stop nearest you. In the Country on Ag Day is brought to you by Pivot Bio. What if you had the nitrogen you need already on seed? Pivot Bio is the first company to apply nitrogen on seed. The nitrogen you need now on seed from Pivot Bio. Learn more at pivotbio.com. Helping seniors maintain a healthy lifestyle can make their latter years more enjoyable. And one LSU Ag Center nutrition agent is on a quest to help teach healthful eating habits for this group. Ag Center reporter Craig Gotro has a story. Every month, Elizabeth Martin goes to the Volunteer of America apartments to highlight healthful eating habits. On this day, she was talking about a topic that virtually everyone indulges in. Snacking. Martin told the participants how you can still get an energy boost in a healthful manner. We talked about pairing macronutrients. So we have our carbohydrates, our protein, and our fat. And how if we pair at least two together, it's a little bit more sustainable as far as keeping our energy where it needs to be. Today's featured snack was a Caprese-inspired one consisting of basil, cheese, and tomatoes. For some, the snack was new to them, and it was easy to put together. They're always asking questions and always telling me they learned something new. Um, and the snack today, I do know, was new for several of them. So um, they, had, they seemed to have a lot of fun building it there themselves. As part of her presentations, Martin distributes recipes and ingredients such as spices for the participants to try. For a lot of them, they're cooking for one person. And so kind of giving them some new ideas of just recipes for one person, um, snacks for one person, and that seems to to really um, be interesting to them and, and helpful. Louisiana residents rank near the bottom in health outcomes, and Martin believes that if she can help people make small changes to their diets, there would be some benefit. Um, and so anytime we can get out there and talk to somebody about nutrition and how even one little step, you know, one little change really can make a difference. 
Martin believes nutrition education is essential in helping to make Louisiana citizens more healthy. With the LSU Ag Center, this is Craig Gotro reporting. All right, thanks, Craig, and that's all the time we have this morning. Be sure you tuned in from all of us here at Ag Day. Have a great day. Have fun.